Right, time to open it to the floor. This gentleman here has his hand up and has had for an awful long time. So this gentleman here with the maroon shirt in the front. Uh, either question or comment directed to the whole panel or to uh, any one of them individually, if you like. Hi, my name's David Leisha. Um, I'm getting three quick um, messages. Firstly, about your health. Yes, overall, we do spend a lot on health. But when you take away the private sector, we have a very high private sector expenditure on mental health, on health in general. When you take that away, our health budget is still, still good, but it's just as equal to any other EU country. So that argument we spend a lot on mental on health in general, it's a lot to be decided. Um, as you probably know, I have a disability, and I also studied economics, and that, you're right, globalisation is good, and it goes open markets, and it goes open trade, and it gets people out of jobs, uh, out of employment into jobs, where the fat majority of people, what it doesn't do and what you brought up the method yourself. It doesn't work for the minority groups. It doesn't take the minority groups who are unemployed and into employment. It rarely does that. For case in point, in Ireland, 70% of people of working age are employed. For the working age of people with disability in Ireland, it only takes 1%. Half of people. And that gets interesting because companies are going on to make the book, make the book. Well, I don't have time to build a ramp. So they're always looking at the bottom line. Yes. That's the problem. That's why we need globalization, but we need the social aspect of it. And that's, I was in Brussels in December, a part of an Irish delegation where I met Matt and um, to the European Parliament of um, people with disabilities. And we voted in uh, an issue or um, a mandate to encourage MEP to get more people with disabilities into politics, uh, political activity. Um, but I'm the only person here with a disability. <laughs> and it upsteps an algorithm we to access, but it's still hard to get it. So just, we need to start thinking about this. Um, my final point is we're all talking about globalisation and we're all talking about budgets and what the EU has done and how the EU is bad. Yeah, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect because it, you know what? It's a living king, and nothing living is perfect. But one thing that EU does, and we have forgotten here, and if you look around, not many young people here, right, below the age of 18, right? And they are losing a disconnect. There's a disconnect happening for a reason that if we don't have Europe, if another country leaves, and quite frankly, it will make the financial crisis look like a party. And Syria will get a spread all over Europe. And that's why we need Europe to prevent us from going to war. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big forgotten thing about Europe. Thank yes. you very much for your comment. I'm going to open it up, but yeah. just to, Dan, if you want to just address sort of the point that he made, that sometimes it leaves a lot of marginalised groups like this gentleman behind. Yeah, again, you know, Ireland, as you said, you know, Ireland's, the, of, of the people in Ireland who have disabilities, we have the lowest in Europe share of people at work. Now, again, I don't think that's a globalisation thing. I don't think it's a European thing. It, you know, there, there are other national factors at play. I just find it very hard to see a correlation 
between globalization, countries that are very globalized, and countries that have low pro proportions of their people with disabilities at work. I think it's more, again, coming back to so many other things, it's a national issue rather than a global or European issue. I would, I would disagree. I would say that you need to get on Irish facts, the Irish national facts, to say, look, you have to raise the United people with disability into your employment. I think, given the fact that Ireland, after 10 years, when you ratify your treaty, but again, it's the old story, you know, if, if bureaucrats interfere where they don't have a mandate, they get accused of not respecting the democratic process. Yeah, they haven't been given the powers, we can't say to them, you should intervene when you don't have a mandate. Matt, you want us to come in yeah. on that and then we'll just open Well, the on, on, an, on another point, but yeah. just on that point, and it is one of the, the, the great difficulties that I think progressives all over Europe have, especially when you're talking about the rights that we have or that were, uh, were in place. Um, as a result of the European Union, but nobody can point to a social right that we got through Europe that we couldn't have got through a government if the government had the political will to actually uh, actually um, de deliver it. Um, so, in, in, and they were agreed by governments at an EU level, probably just the, the, the power of numbers. And I think that's what you're talking about yeah. in terms of, um, and, but there are UN treaties we've signed up to another convention in relation to rights of people with disabilities. The difficulty has always come in terms of the implementation of them at a national level. But just in terms of the globalization, and I probably didn't make this point um, well earlier on when I was talking about what it ha has, has meant, because I, I think we're beyond the debate as to whether globalization is good or bad, because globalization is a reality. Um, what we need to talk about is how do we respond to the obvious disadvantages and problems that globalization has created? Okay, so we can have an argument about whether they outweigh or mm. um, are um, overmatched by the positives, but there have been negatives. And one of the negatives has undoubtedly been the disconnect from citizens from the political process. Lots of people believe that they don't actually have a say in terms of how they address their concerns. And sometimes opportunity presents themselves where people can just give a two fingers to the political system, whether it be through Brexit or through Trump or through the far right. Um, and the difficulty I have with the European Union in, in large is that they haven't been taking those messages, because they are messages from people who, um, um, and the European Union has actually got quite a, a number of them. I mentioned the constitution in France and Germany. Yeah. When they rejected the European constitution, European leaders came back into a room. And they could have done two, one of two things in my view. They could have said, okay, what were the reasons why the people of France and Netherlands voted against this, and how can we address those concerns? Or they could have done what they did do, which was, how do we get this thing through without actually having anybody to vote on it again? Um, which was what their priority was. And they came up with the Lisbon Treaty, which was um, a convoluted set of amendments. But in, a sen in, in essence, the same thing. That was the message. They got the message again then, um, in numerous times in terms of election results and in terms of um, political symbol, um, the Greek people responding to the fiscal compact. Brexit, again, has been another, whatever you like, uh, and we don't obviously like, that result, but it was a message to Europe, and the answer of European leaders has largely always been, let's do what we always intended to do anyway, only do it quicker and with less, um, I call it the Las Vegas political philosophy, you know, just double up every time that you get a message that says we don't like where you're going, well we'll go even harder, um, and the problem is that that creates more disillusionment, like, and to such a point that I was in the European Parliament last year, and there were MEPs almost dancing in the chamber with the victory that was the fact that only 35%, only 35% of French people voted for an actual fascist. Like that's how, uh, how, how, how crazy our political systems have become and the sense of this illusion that we actually consider that to be, uh, to be and then when you actually look at what Macron <coughs> is um, doing in terms of labour reforms, uh, so-called labour reforms and everything else, you right. wonder is he actually creating the scenario and the foundation, laying the foundation yeah. block to actually making sure that a fascist is actually I'm, elected at I'm some point I'm going to let come back in on that, but just in the meantime, we just have hands up for someone else who'd like to do someone with the microphone. Um, actually, these, these ladies here at the very front table here with the tracksuit, we give the microphone to them, but just in the meantime, That's Michael, you want to address... Yeah, can, can I just make a point? Uh, again, it's very simplistic, I think, to say, well, it's, uh, Europe has lurched to the right or to the left. That isn't the case. 
So if you heard Pascal Dunham make the point a long time ago, about 12 months ago, he said the centre must hold, and the centre has held. Yeah, there was a vote uh, in, in the UK for Brexit, that was two years ago. But since then, about 65% of the population of Europe have gone to national elections. And, uh, and in the main, they've held. There have been some results where you have coalitions, like what's happened in Italy, where your party on the far right, who are now in government. But let's see how they get on. And the centre has held and held quite well, better than anybody anticipated. So subsequent to Brexit, we then had the American election result, which was a surprise also. Mm -hmm. But in the main, the centre has held and held well. OK. Uh, girls here at the front table, uh, what's your name and what would you like to say to the panel? Um, my name's Neve, and I just want to acknowledge Matt's comment about the government's uh, tackling of the current health crisis. This government also oversaw the Apple tax scandal in which they refused for ages to accept the thir old 13 billion in tax, which could have been much needed investment into our public services, for example, our health service, which is in need of investment and in need of better services, but like corporations, they, they do serve a purpose, that's fine, but running after them and doing dirty deals with them, that doesn't represent the ordinary citizen, it doesn't represent the ordinary taxpayer, and what it does is it um, assists those who are um, playing the tax system and that's being facilitated at the minute widespread. Inside. As a young person, what, what do you think about globalisation? Do you think that it, it makes you more optimistic about the future? Does it give you a little bit of fear or what do you think about it? Sides and downsides, yeah. okay. Can I ask a question? Are you a member of a party? I am, yeah. Which party? Sinn It's good to see the next generation are involved in the tax and spend, the tax and spend. In relation to the acts. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not. No, no. She just says no, pay no, your taxes I'm, rather I'm, than I'm, tax and I'm, spend. I'm quite happy to call it as it is. And I, I listen to it every day in the Dáil Chamber when we're in there, just in the last month from opposition parties. Well, can I just There's say this? No, Michael's just government has just spent 450 finish, million no, euros. No, actually, no. just let me finish, please. Um, what I'm so saying about is the tax and spend. In the last month, there was a requirement, uh, an ask from opposition parties, costing an extra 400 million. <coughs> we can't. We, the last decade has been too hard. It's been too tough on too many people for us to go back and do that again. Okay. And I can assure you, Taoiseach won't do it and the Minister for Finance won't do it. We will not create an unsustainable tax position uh, because we want to keep spending to be populist. Okay, let's, let's try and keep the discussion to, to European sure. and global stuff. Yeah. Anyone else with a hand up who'd like to make a question? This gentleman here in the front row. Uh, so what's your name? Your uh, my name is Kieran Rogers, unaffiliated. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to say, you, you know, one of the huge dynamics in history has been uh, migrations of peoples, be it through the fall of the Roman Empire or Muslim conquests or whatever, and certainly in my opinion as regards Brexit, uh, the vote for Brexit, uh, fear is always a huge motivator as regards people voting, and certainly the um, Brexit campaigners really tapped into this visceral fear that many UK citizens had about an influx of foreigners, uh, and to some extent, although the centre has held reasonably well, I think much of the tension is because people feel a sense of maybe cultural dilution, mm. that globalisation itself involves not just a freer movement of goods, but a freer movement of peoples. And I think many people feel a genuine fear, oh, we seem to be overwhelmed by Syrians or Africans or whatever. So I just wanted to ask the panel in general, how, how do you feel about the EU's immigration policies and its contribution towards Perception of the start, I know that the you both do want to come in on that, but we haven't heard very much from this end of the panel on that. So, Marie, do you want to start on that? What do you think about the, the role and do people fear globalisation because it makes them feel that their national identities and cultures are under threat? Of course. Well, the thing is, if, if, if somebody is unemployed or if they're barely, like, is in, are, are not eking out a decent uh, standard of living, then somebody uh, coming into town and taking up employment, of course, people are going to, to fear that. So, in some ways, um, uh, you know, it's cultural and it's economic, um, and, uh, and and I think you're right. I absolutely agree with you with regards to the factors that accounted for the Brexit vote. So that's why, in some ways, it's so important to make sure that people are adequately skilled, and that also, I suppose, um, I suppose one of, well, a, a separate point to make is that you know, with regards to Ireland, 
we've actually had very few numbers of migrants come in. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact numbers of our commitments, but certainly with regards to Syrian refugees coming to Ireland, they're a lot lower than what we actually committed to. So in some ways, I don't think we've been exposed to the same extent. We've had a lot of uh, inter-EU migration into Ireland with regards to um, those from Central and Eastern Europe, and I suppose 30% of employment growth over the past four years in this country has been by workers um, uh, from Central and Eastern Europe and beyond those borders. Um, but I suppose in terms of the uh, migration from outside of Europe, into Ireland, we have not had that to the same extent as other countries. Dan, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think you pick up a very important point because I, you know, I spent most of my life as an economic migrant in other countries. Uh, I live in Dublin 8, the most sort of diverse part of the country. Uh, I'm a sort of globalist type of person. I don't have an issue. But that doesn't make me a better person than somebody who is a, a uncomfortable with an increasingly diverse society. And I, this notion that diversity is morally better I think we need to be careful about that because you end up talking down to people who are just more comfortable with the familiar and they want to be able to talk about the local GAA game with their neighbour and that they feel that that increased diversity means they may not be able to do that. Now, I think we just need to be very careful about talking down to people like that, people of my view of just dismissing them as racists and bigots. I think too much of that has gone on. I think it still goes on in this country about Britain and Brexit. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff going on in the Brexit thing about British history, about British character. Um, it can't all be dismissed as this is, a, you know, a bunch of uh, bigots and racists. And I think a lot of Irish people have done that about the Brexit vote. You know, we just need to be uh, listen to people's concerns. And if people feel that migration is maybe running too far, then governments, you know, may have to say, okay, well, let's just slow things down. And that is not a morally bad. Uh, position to take. And if, people, if governments don't listen to discomfort about levels of migration, I think then you risk getting into the sort of territory that we've moved towards in Europe lately. I think just we need, those of us who are of my persuasion, need to be a little bit more respectful and listen more to people who are uncomfortable with that change. Michael, can you ever see the EU take that kind of direction where the EU has been so built around freedom of movement that it could get to a point where it might actually say this is perhaps needs to be slowed down a bit? Are you talking about migration into the EU? Well, even into or within. Um, I don't see the EU moving in any way from within. Um, Ireland is a great example of a, a good result in terms of migration. So if you take the last census, one person in six wasn't born in Ireland. And I take Dan's point, and I think it's, it's important to part of the, where the EU, I'm critical of the EU, they tend not to listen as well as they should. So Dan's point about listening to people who have an alternative view, you don't have to agree with it, but we should listen. And I think that's kind of what Dan is saying. And we haven't been good enough to listen. Um, but we've done it much better than just about any other jurisdiction. So if you take one in six, that's a higher rate than nearly everywhere else in terms of not people not having been born here. And we've integrated very well. Whereas I think in other jurisdictions, there's been the ghettoization of people either from within the EU or from same, same, same countries. So you have towns in, in, in other jurisdictions that have people from different countries. And the people from the, that town aren't pleased. And you had a lot of that in Northern England uh, in the Brexit vote. Uh, Matt, very briefly, while we try and get another question, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what we have seen happen is that you're dealing with communities who are disillusioned, angry, frustrated in many respects. They're not exactly sure as to who it is that um, they need to blame. These are people who lost their jobs as a result of globalization, who um, are working harder than their parents did. There are two incomes coming into the house and so, um, if, they're, if they're lucky, and yet they had they saw their parents had their mortgage paid off, had the car bought, were able to take a family holiday every year, and they're working twice as hard. There's two people doing it um, instead of one. They have smaller families, all the things that should point to a better quality of life, and yet they find it even tougher than the generation that went before them. And what we've seen is... Um, a, very clever mechanism that in some cases um, was caused by um, government's actions and where people have been scapegoated. 
So those people who are frustrated because of all of those things have been told that the person that is responsible for that is the person that looks different than them and the person who sounds different for them and the person who comes from. And the European Union isn't um, this great entity when it comes to migration. Yes, internal freedom of movement um, is a cornerstone of the EU, um, rightly so in my, my view. But the European Union at the moment actually has a very poor record, I would argue, in terms of dealing with the migration crisis. It is expecting, um, I saw, like, for example, going back to my old friend Macron yesterday, hitting out at the Italian government now, the Italian government's um, position in relation to the Aquarius um, ship is scandalous and should be considered such as Irish people with our own history of coffin ships and everything else like that. But the French government have actually been driving back in their thousands uh, um, migrants who are in Italy trying to make their way to France have been bolting the, bolting the door and sending them back using the, the Dublin re regulations. So, listen, there's lots of causes for migration. In most cases, most of the migrants that we have in Ireland, the people who um, Michael are talking about, are people from other parts of Europe who come over to work. In many cases, they're being enticed to come over by companies in order so that they, do, and pay, so they can be paid less than Irish um, workers um, would be entitled to. The other migrants um, are coming from places that they would prefer to be living in. The pro reason they're leaving them is because they're war-torn, um, largely because of um, wars that European um, countries um, were engaged in, um, and, they have, and they have suffered as a result of decisions. And I just think, um, whether it's politically expedient or not, I just think, especially coming from Ireland, I was born in England, I um, um, sometimes I'm reluctant to admit, admit but um, I, I, you know, I think every one of our families has experience of migration when I talk you know the, when you talk about the family if it wasn't for emigration and the prospect of Irish people being able we wouldn't yeah. probably wouldn't exist as a people we wouldn't them. exist as a people at all so I just think we have a moral obligation to say if somebody's coming from a place like Syria or Iraq or places that um, have been devastated then I think we just have a responsibility to um, find them a home. Gentlemen at the very back of the room there. Was it, was it yourself? Was. Thanks. I guess for me, the issue of globalisation is the challenge of the nation state. It doesn't have enough power. I don't share Matt's touch and view of the nation state. And if we're about pool sovereignty, how do we ensure that Europe becomes back to the vision it had of 30, 40 years ago? But you see, how do we make Europe much more democratic? And how do we empower and engage Europe active as citizens? I'd be quite keen to hear the panel's views of how we re energise European project. Okay. Matt and then Dan. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think it is, ab it is about respect and, f and figuring out how we can respect um, the decisions that people democratically um, um, send us and not just dismiss those, those decisions that we don't like. I'm often conflicted because I do support those EU directives that provide um, rights to citizens um, um, and protect citizens, particularly workers, women, um, um, people with disabilities in some, in some like instances. In some, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I want, and, but, and there are some things that can only be dealt with at a European level can't deal with climate change as an island of Ireland. We have to deal with it at a European level. There are some issues vis-a-vis -vis, um, globalisation. Tax avoidance. You know, I will argue um, um, to, um, to the day I die the rights of national parliaments to set its own taxation powers. But at the same time, there, if we want to have tax justice globally, then there has to be an EU and a global response in terms of transparency matters and um, country by country reporting and, thing, and, and thing, things like that. So them things have to have. The, the problem and where I get conflicted is the best thing about politics, the way we get people like Neve to join a political party, which I think young people should be commended for joining um, political parties, by the, by the way. But the way we get them engaged is by convincing them that if anybody in government, whether it's a Sinn Féin government or a Fianna Gael government or a Fianna Fáil government, if you don't like what they do, that's the beauty of democracy. You can kick them out. The big problem at the European Union level is if something is put in place, good, bad or indifferent, and citizens decide that they don't like that, not only do they have to kick out their government, they have to hope that 26 or 27 other countries do the same, um, because that's what it takes. And that's where I have a problem in terms of the democratic framework of the uh, EU. Yes, if there was better transparency and an overview and people were engaged in the decisions that were made at an EU level. Yes, there is a level, you could argue that it's a, de it's a democratic framework um, at, 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 at that level. The problem is, part of democracy means you can also change laws if you don't like them, and that's very difficult at the European you Union power. level. Sorry, Mike, you could see power to, you could see power up and down. You have subsidiarity where you take power away from Europe, you power up to Europe, and that's up to MEPs and others like yourself to have that conversation with Europe. 
and we're doing it. Yeah, and we're doing it. My big problem, and I suppose this is, a, is that we are all collectively, it's not, the biggest power, the biggest problem isn't that the EU has too much power, although in some areas it does. The biggest problem is that corporations have too much power. Going back to the areas of the Apples and the Facebooks and the Amazons, and the, they have more power than some member states of the European Union. And unless we collectively tackle that, well then that's where I, that's where I really fear um, that the, globaliza yeah. the effect yeah. of globalisation on the market. The so I've been involved in the European Union in some capacity for about 20 years, and if I had a euro for every time somebody asked you a question, how do you make Europe closer to the people, I'd have about 13 billion at this stage. Um, I don't think there is an answer to it, because I think, well, as I said, the, the kind of thing the EU does, it doesn't have, it doesn't do the stuff, the health, the education, the stuff that people pay most attention to in politics. It doesn't have the human drama that you have in national politics. Like, ever listen to an, a, a debate of MEPs, most of it is through simultaneous translation, which like, would send even a politics anorak to sleep. Uh, so I think the nature of what it does and just that kind of lack of human drama means that it's never really going to engage people. And, I, I, uh, you know, as I say, I've heard that question put so many times and I still haven't heard a good answer to it. I'm not sure there is one. Marie, do you have a good answer? No, but I, but I suppose <laughs> I, I, do, I do think, though, that, and, and I suppose Matt touched on it, like as in it is the... Um, the objectives of the of, of, of the of, of the European Union in terms of what the project, the EU project wants to achieve, and certainly issues like climate change, Ireland and so on can achieve very, very little. Um, certainly with regards to migration as well, and again where she is is because we're so much further north compared with the southern Mediterranean countries. But there are transnational issues that the EU can, I suppose, adopt and be ambitious on and and, and bring its people along with it. But I you know I, I think because I suppose we have so many layers and I think there's, you know, like as in Ireland probably does better than other countries with regards to an awareness of the council and the commission and the parliament and, and, and the powers between them all. But I, I, I think ultimately the structure lends itself to that sense of being at a remove and people not being able to understand how power functions. At, Mike, at the Mike yeah. do you think that we need to be reminded sometimes that maybe the EU needs to be reminded of what its mission is, that maybe it's not really sure what its role is in citizens' lives, that maybe it goes too far sometimes? What you have to remember as well that the mission evolves. So if you go back to after World War II and the establishment of, of the precursor to the European Union, um, the mission really was to stop Europe, well, not so much Europe, Britain, France and Germany going Go to, to war. war every couple of decades. So the period that we have today, 75 years almost later, is the first period of 75 years that those three countries haven't gone and ravaged one another at some stage or another. And, but it's also evolved now into, so going back, that was it, where it started, then it wanted to feed itself. So the common agriculture policy was hugely important going back to ensure that Europe would be fed. The idea in today's you know, uh, coming to the end of the second decade of this century, that this continent, just a couple of decades prior to that, may not be able to feed itself. It's just alien to so many young people. But it's evolving, uh, the, 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 the mission is evolving as well. And I think one of the things, my criticism about democracy in Europe is of the parliament. That on, I, was, I shared a stage with William Hay during the week, and I made the point that the UKIP party found themselves in a position that they were able to get on the political stage by winning seats in a European election where there was less than 20% turnout. So the European Parliament elections, on so, so many occasions, the turnout is really, really poor. Average, about 35%. Mm. So there's, more, there's a lot more people who choose not to participate in that way uh, than perhaps they should. And that's a great pity because if you take the referendum last week, almost 70%, most general elections here range between 65 and 70%. But the Tory party in the UK got spooked because the UKIP won a nice number of seats on a turnout of between 20, 25%, which is remarkable. Mm. And that's what happened. And that's how Brexit came about. Yeah, it does, does raise the whole question again of the demographic deficit, and we could have a whole other event. But the deficit on that stage was in the voters. They yeah. chose not to participate. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions, but I'm just mindful that I've only had one female contributor so far. So, is there any women in the audience who'd like to make a question? Jed, lady over here at the right hand side. Uh, your name, and if you have any affiliations, and your question, please. Eva, I am. How are you? 
might change and the main affiliation is right to home, so don't even get me started on what we might have done um, if we had taxed the profits of the vulture funds. Um, I think that what we've missed is, as a national government, what can we do to mitigate uh, the issues around globalization? And my understanding is, and you touched on productivity, um, that one of the um, main drivers of increased productivity at the beginning of the 2000s was uh, women entering the job market in greater and greater numbers. And that has actually uh, leveled off. And one of the things that national government could do, for instance, is better childcare. Ireland has the highest childcare costs in the, in, certainly in Northern Europe, in Europe, the only country in the OECD with higher childcare costs is the US. So again, if we're looking at what the things are that we can do in Ireland as a national government to mitigate the impact of globalization, let's increase productivity and let's do it on the back of better policy around childcare. The other piece with the distribution of wealth, I think that we have to start to look at very radical approaches, whether it's universal basic income or better social safety nets, the kinds of things that will make people less nervous about migration that make people have less of a knee-jerk reaction. Um, and let's talk about some of the things that we could be doing here. We're a very passive lot. And oh no, we can't change that. The EU says no. And yet, we'll duck and dive and get around every other regulation on the planet. Uh, but oh no, the EU said no. So I, I guess I would like to hear more from each of you about what Ireland, at a national level, can, can do to mitigate the impact of globalization. Okay. I'm going to try a novel experiment, and I'm going to try and give each of the four of you 45 seconds to answer that question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, look, at it, it sharpens your, your thoughts, uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Marie. You have 45 seconds, starting from now. <laughs> Okay, well, firstly, I very much share your sentiment on, on, on childcare, and uh, certainly, I think it's when you look at what how little Ireland has done in the childcare space compared with other EU countries um, uh, over the past number of years, then, 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 then certainly, um, uh, you know, it, it, you know, but it, it, it's a role for, for, for national funding. Just in terms of, uh, I suppose, that level, that, I suppose, the, the, the mobile migration of capital. Um, and and uh, and global. Uh, I suppose touching on the bigger issue of globalisation. At the moment, I think as a country, we don't fully understand even the levels of, of 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 capital coming in and out. And indeed, then if we don't understand, then I think it's hard for us to even identify how we can begin to more equitably distribute between labour and capital in this country. But we do know that there has been a greater shift towards capital in terms of the gains from output in this country compared with the gains going towards labour. Um, and that has to be remedied by our tax system in particular, but also I think in terms of the rules regarding corporates in this country, in particular the growing number of, of companies that are now able to become unlimited companies. And it's a very small domestic example. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I think there's an issue with even understanding um, what is happening with regards to, 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 to mobile uh, Flows in You'll notice that I actually went for about a minute and a half. I know, there, yeah. I'm actually, I'm I'm the most I, I realise that's where I said 45 seconds is actually a really, really short time. So yeah. I'm going to give you. Preparation, I'll give each minutes. of you 45 seconds twice. Uh, so, Dan, <laughs> Dan your, your minute and a half, Dan, starts now. Okay, I'm going to try and keep it at 45. Um, I, as I say, I think Ireland has done very well out of globalisation. Uh, I don't think we need to talk about mitigation. I think we need to talk about taking advantage of it. And one of the parts of that is to talk less about all the how. It, all these terrible things that come with it and talk more about the opportunities, tell people there are good opportunities there, uh, and let people think about it in a more positive way, how they can start businesses, do international business, uh, do more for themselves, empower people, take opportunities from it. That was only 28 seconds. Let's back that up for later on. Um, Michael Darcy, your minute and a half starts now. Yeah, for me, the biggest issue in terms of globalization is if when industries evolve and when jobs are lost, how we get people back educated and back re-skilled, and back re-energised to get people back to work. A great example I have was a guy who was unemployed as a chef in Limerick for three and a half years. He started to work with a, with a funds administration company in the tech side. He had no knowledge about technology whatsoever. He turned out to be a natural coder. He participated in an international competition. He won 100,000 euros in that competition. So there are so many examples of so many people who might start off as a brickie 
or a chef or driving a van who have natural skill sets and abilities that get left behind because they may not have gone to college or they may not have, have started in, in that space, but that we need to have a fleet of foot in terms of getting people back into the workspace. I started off talking about uh, the letter factory in the town that I, lived in, that I know best where people were unemployed when they lost their one job. That can't happen. Only a minute and five. You guys are very efficient when I give you time. Uh, Matt Carthy, a minute and a half. Never, never spoken a minute and a half. Be like, like, okay, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try a new approach. Three, two, <laughs> one. One, uh, okay, just to say something that for a long period of time became the most unpopular notion in politics in Ireland and across many parts, of, and that's the idea of state intervention. Um, and I think we need to go back to the basis that there are some public services that are so important that the state needs to provide them. Childcare is a good example. We basically left childcare to the private sector and it actually took the community sector to intervene and start providing services around the place. So in some instances, we've seen it in housing, in health, in, um, uh, in the provision of um, broadband, across the, across the board, services that we've allowed the private sector to basically came over and then we've subsidized those private companies delivering them millions of euro, um, euros of our money. So the state should actually get back to actually providing those services that are so important because the alternative is that the private systems in place will be the best you can get if you can afford them and if you happen to be living in the place where they're there, but they'll actually um, 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 broaden inequalities. And then the second part of it is that those individuals and companies that benefit from that investment in public services actually start paying their fair share of tax so that we can be reinvesting it. Again, I don't, it, there was a time where that wasn't a radical thing to say, but to suggest that actually government should actually provide um, uh, services and that people who may do well out of those services pay a fair share of tax, they become radical notions. I think we should go back to them. Fair enough. It was only a minute and 26 as well. I That's had a, a record for a me. Yeah. I should have had a stopwatch at you all evening. Uh, this gentleman here at the front has been, uh, had his hand up very politely all evening, so it's about time we, we uh, gave him a chance to have a say. Uh, microphone is right behind you, sir. Uh, your name, uh, any affiliations you have, and the point you'd like to make, please. Michael O'Neill, and my only affiliation will be to the town of Dundalk itself. Fair <laughs> <place. laughs> Globalisation has had many serious downsides. Intel, which is one of the most famous companies to come into Ireland, had to move out of a, out of a manufacturing base in America when the environmental impact of the company became apparent. It's now gone to Vietnam, where those environmental problems are being played out amongst the people who work for the firm. The other thing about glo glo globalization is that we have an artificially high standard of living, which has come about from cheap imports. If I can go on to eBay and buy a small transistor for two pounds, and it can be posted to me from, from China, and they make a profit. Something's wrong some, somewhere. We have a situation where Intel, the head of Intel two years ago said there were five reasons why they came to Ireland. And there's only one reason left, and that is the taxation system. If that, if that taxation system has to be changed as a result of Trump's actions, we are in a serious situation. We have depended too much on foreign investment and we have lost an awful lot of jobs. And going back to a point that you made, we say we have more people employed in this country than ever before, but those jobs are very poorly paid. And you made a point where two household, two pays are going into a household and still they don't have the standard of living that their parents had. So we have a distorted economy where the wealth is, is concentrated on a very small percentage of people. David Dimbleby Dim made a series on BBC called How We Built Britain. And in the final scene of that series, he's standing in Canary Wharf at night where the background is all the office blocks lit, lit up. And he said, in the past, the power lay with the church. Then the power moved to the politicians. And with a sweeping wave of his arm, he said, this is where the power now lies. 
So you gentlemen up there, who, when you are involved in politics, may think you're having an impact or an influence, or you may think you're doing something. But you are dependent upon the, the influence and the control of major corporations, major investment funds. When you have the top 1% of people control about 85% of the wealth of the world, you have a problem. Okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, I come, Michael. Uh, just because you mentioned both Matt and Dan, I'm going to give each of you, and stop what really works for you, so I'm going to give each of you 60 seconds, and then the gentleman back there has been waiting for a while as well, and then we might have to wrap it up after that. Uh, Matt, 60 seconds to respond to what Michael said. Yeah, to Michael's right. Inequality is um, it's a buzzword, but it's actually the root cause of an awful lot of the problems we see in the world, and, how we tack and if we can tackle inequality, either at national, European, or global level, I think we can actually start addressing um, the, the co concerns that, that, that you have um, raised. The problem in terms of one of the issues of globalisation is we're never going to get back to the level of manufacturing that was previously, uh, previously in place in a lot of countries. And even if you were, you're never going to get back to the levels of people who were employed in manufacturing um, in Western countries because of the robots and computers doing the job now. So we need to figure out the alternative ways of doing it and we need to be open minded you know someone mentioned the basic income idea earlier on it's one i'm not convinced on but i think we need to have ideas like that and um, because we need to figure out how we can actually insert equality um, into society thanks for that Dan, your yeah like i have to say 95 percent of what you said i just fundamentally disagree with and i just think you're factually wrong in a number of things to say that we're not as rich as our parents like i i would ask most people here would i think think they are better off than we were 30 years ago you know, I grew up in the 80s. I, I just think this country is much better now than it was uh, when my pa parents were my age. Yeah, yeah, people. But, but are, are, do, you, do, do, do people fee really believe that we're poorer today than we were in the 80s? Yes. Okay. Yes. When it comes to housing, okay. So you see, that's, that's when it you know, breaks down. Housing prices have gone up. But it, it, are we overall saying that we are now less well off? than we were in the 80s. I, I, I just, yes. you know. No, uh, <laughs> well, like certainly any, you know, as I often make a point on these things. Of course, there are many things wrong, but there's not to deny that. But the point that we're poorer than we were in the 1980s, you know, we, we spend we spend millions of taxpayers' money every year. Step down, finish for a second, sorry, please. We spend millions. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's a very important point, but I'm taking the point, are we poorer on average than we were 30, than our parents were? Hands up, and, how many, and certainly, hands up how many people in the well, room, hands up how many people in the room think that the current generation is lesser off than the one from 30 years previous? Lesser off or lesser off? Yeah, lesser off. No, no uh, the lesser current off. generation is worse off than the current one that came ahead of it. Worse off because you need to concentrate on disposable yeah. So, hands up how many people think that the current generation is worse off than its parents? That was what you asked the person. Yeah. yeah. And how many people think the current generation is better off than its parents? But, yeah. That's interesting. Sure. Two hands up here. Uh, Marie, you want to come in on that one? Yeah, just two things there, right? I, I, I think um, certainly when you look at incomes, right? Okay, the market, what people earn, is better now than what uh, our parents certainly earned, or certainly my parents earned in, 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 in the 70s and 80s. But is the cost of living, right? And in particular, housing, right? Like my parents were able to build their house for £11,000 and pay off with a local authority loan over a period of 30 years. Now, the number of local authority loans that became available during the, the 90s and the 2000s dwindled to nothing. So people, of course, were put into the arms of banks and in some ways credit was able to fund people's lifestyles. So in terms of there is a share of my generation now who are worse off because of housing costs, because of childcare costs. Um, We're such a welfare society. Why? Because we've got the worst homeless problem we've ever had uh, in this country since the fifties began. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't ask this man here the second. But, 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 if, we, if, if you say we are wealthier than we've ever been, why do we have the worst homeless problem there's ever been? But can I just answer that, right, okay, for a second? Because of decisions made, right, by successive governments in the nineties and the 2000s to stop building house, social housing Absolutely. in this country, so right? So hand the globalisation comes to grief. Well, yeah, yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, but can I just 
it's been touched on a number of times today, which is with regards to our tax system, right? And somebody has mentioned Apple and, 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 and whatever else. I think there is a real debate that needs to take place in this country with regards to our corporation tax rate, okay? And for years, it was the, we cannot have that debate because companies are going to leave the, the, the country. Well, I'm not so convinced about that. And I say, I say that as somebody who is, uh, works for a trade union who's got a lot of members in those multinational companies, right? So, you know, we're concerned as well about the debate, but I think it needs to happen. Because there was a report came out yesterday, I haven't read it in full yet, I think it was um, the, the, the Public Accounts Committee, and it talked about there's the top 100 um, companies in this, in, in this country account for 70% of corporate tax revenues. Now, if there's any lesson that we need to learn from the 2000s, it's not being overly dependent on any one part of the Irish economy uh, to fund our public services, right? Uh, and we saw the over-dependence on construction and to a lesser extent retail um, in the 2000s. And now we're seeing a different type of dependence. Um, and corporate taxation, I think, is the second or third largest uh, tax head um, amongst the tax revenues in this country. So one of the things I think we need to talk about is our corporate, corporate tax rate. I'm not in favour of a significant increase in our corporate tax rate, but I think what has not been spoken about is an effective rate of corporate tax. We have it for income tax, for personal income tax in this country. We don't have it for corporates. Okay, well, let's, let's hear yeah. then from the Can I just answer the part. question just the gentleman about I'll, I'll get your mic and then I will let you address the gentleman's question at the back, and then we will come to the gentleman with the beard who's been waiting very politely for his, his turn with the microphone. Yeah. Uh, Michael, about corporation tax. Yeah, corporate, I think it's really important to understand that the companies who come here from outside of the jurisdiction come here for certainty. The corporation tax in Ireland is 12.5%. It's been that for decades. The effective rate that you speak about, um, we, we get a lot of criticism from our competitors about the headline rate, 12.5%. Most other jurisdictions' headline rate is much higher than that. Exactly. Their effective rate, most of them pay less than what, what ours is. So there was a report from PAC yesterday that said it's eight. The effective rate is between somewhere between 8 and 10.5%. We have practically no deductions. The main deduction that we have is research and development, which is absolutely legitimate for companies who choose to come and establish here. Where we find ourselves in the corporation tax rate, the challenge is not spending it. And that's a big challenge. So what happened in the past was the Charlie McCreevy version of politics. If I have it, I spend it. The challenge we have now is that while it's coming in, and it's increased an incredible amount, went from 3.9 billion three and a half years ago, 8.2 billion so in 2017 and we expect that figure will go over 9 billion mm -hmm. in this calendar year so the challenge to the body politic is to be careful and not to be reckless that just because we know it's in Take this year yeah. just come in, comes in this year that we spend it because it might not come in in subsequent years and that's a big challenge because there's enormous pressure on the department of finance pascal Danu, and everybody in the from the body politic to keep spending and, and I have said it earlier, the last decade was too hard to go back and do all of that again. I know, Matt, I think you do want to come back on that, but we're, we're already over time as it is, and I've committed to, to letting Dan comment and then to the, the gentleman at the back as well. Um, gentleman at the back, just the very back, do you want to just summarise again the argument that you'd like Dan to respond to, and then we'll let him do it? Okay, so if, if you're going to say that globalisation is good for Irish society... Thanks. If, you, if you're going to say that globalisation is good for Irish society... How is it, right, you talk about all the extra wealth that's in the country, that we are sitting upon, right, one of the worst homeless crises that this country has ever seen since records began, right? We also have a complete defunct health service that can't cope with any more people coming into the country, right, and relying upon an already overburdened health service, right? If globalization is so good, how is it that we have all the migrants that even come into this country, right, end up in so many occasions in more vulnerable positions, right, where they have landlords that don't even afford them basic human rights in the accommodation that they afford to them. So, so with all this extra wealth that's in the country, why is it not being redistributed you know, in a fair and proportionate way? Okay. okay. Thanks, the, I'm, not, I'm not going to get into the redistribution. That's a much bigger question. But why, why do we have homeless? homelessness now? Ten years ago, the building industry collapsed. It stopped building houses. 
The population has increased by 400,000. So, could, could I just finish the point? Sorry, can I just finish? Say, let that finish the point, please, sir. Thank you. Okay. I, I, that's a, I'm just simply trying to answer your question. I know that. Well, well could you just let me do sir, it? Could you, sir, please, thank you. The building industry collapsed. No houses, or very few houses, were built over 10 years. The population rose by 400,000. That's, it wasn't globalization that collapsed the building industry. Let him, sorry, let him finish his answer, sir, please. It wasn't globalization that collapsed the building industry. We screwed up that, that ourselves here in this country that allowed that to collapse. It is not about globalization. It is because we messed up. Uh, this gentleman here at the back has been waiting very, very politely for a long time. Thank you for, for being so patient, sir. Your, your name, affiliations, and uh, yeah, questions. Martin Mernon, I'm a Finnegan member, and the question I have to the is, uh, how, much of the fear, how much of the fear surrounding the EU and globalisation do they attribute to nostalgia? Um, I was chatting with somebody there recently Good in the 80s or 70s, and herself and her friend were having a coffee with me, and the one said, oh, the good old days. And the retort was, what was good about them? There was damp running down the insides of the walls. We had to go to the well for water. We're in a far better place now. So I'd just like to ask, do you feel that so, um, nostalgia... And it's down to nostalgia? Uh, yes, it's down okay, to nostalgia. Right. Uh, uh, we are already running very well over time, so we'll try and keep it again to a minute and a half, and we will start with Matt, please. Go. Uh, no, I don't think so, actually. Um, I think it, people, by and large, in Ireland support our membership of the EU, for example. They support our 12.5% tax rate for all its... Um, I think what they have a problem with is actually... Um, some of the direction. So I think the biggest problem people have with the, with the corporation tax system in Ireland isn't the rate that people are paying. It's the people who aren't paying at all or who are using Ireland um, as a mechanism for um, avoidance tax. A lot of the increase in receipts in corporation tax haven't actually been as a result of increase in economic activity. They've been a, a, as a result of profit shifting of multinational that, companies. That's wrong. We had... That's, no, it's that's actually wrong. It's true. It's wrong. Well, let me just say this, Michael. Wrong. Let me just say this. Well, well, every, what you every, say, have it correct. I that's know. wrong. Okay, well, let me say this. Every, I've been a member of a um, special um, inquiry committee on tax avoidance, tax evasion, and money laundering by corporations in the European Parliament. Every single, every, not some, every single report that has been presented to our committee has um, earmarked Ireland as a location of facilitating of tax avoidance. And from that level to some that have gone as far, and including a report yesterday um, co-authored by Gabriel um, Zuckman that called Ireland not a tax haven, but their worst tax haven. Now, the difficulty with tax havens, and because right. Michael and the yeah. Department of um, Finance and everybody will come down very strongly, um, I was talking tax haven status. It's like early rising and good kissing. It doesn't really matter what you think. It's really important what your reputation is. Um, and that the problem is that we actually have a reputation okay. for facilitating mass tax avoidance. And the point in this is that rather than actually um, endorsing and supporting our foreign direct investment, we're actually putting it under threat because companies are becoming under increasing pressure from their customers and their shareholders not to be associated in any way with the whole notion of tax avoidance because people are recognising the damage that that's causing to the developing okay. world right. and to society in a whole. And if we don't actually get our act together and start cutting off those massive loopholes that are in place, well, then we're actually going to ensure that we don't receive for, um, for foreign direct investment coming into our you country. You were doing so well with the stopwatch. Sure. <laughs> it was a really important point. It was, it was a fair point, uh, which, for which reason, then, I'll give Michael two and a half minutes to respond to both the nostalgia point and the yeah, tax pattern. Well, 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 I, I think the tax, uh, tax haven is a country that has yeah, it pays a rate of zero tax. Ours is 12.5%. It's been 12.5% for decades, and I don't think there'll be any movement upon it. Um, a lot of our competitors complain about Ireland and the Irish tax rate, but they don't complain when there were other jurisdictions that had lower rates than ours because they're not successful. Uh, we have a lot of reasons for being successful. The tax rate and the tax certainty here is one of them. In terms of nostalgia, you know, the room was a bit shocked about when are we better off than we were 30 years ago. We are infinitely better off than we were 30 years ago. There's no question about that. I, I don't know how many of you remember mobile homes people's back gardens. That was, that was the answer to homelessness and the likes of that in the past. And we, the population in the 1980s were so much better off than the population in the 1950s that this gentleman was talking about also. The era of overcrowded housing and six, eight people in one house, 10 people banged into one house, that era is over. Now we have challenges 
And uh, one thing I want to say about the gentleman who said something about the health service. The health service isn't all wrong. There are challenges. There's no question about that. But there's quite a few people who enter the health service and get a good service. It's not, as I said, it's not all right. But people shouldn't be saying that equally it's all wrong because it's not. Thank you very much, Dan Michael. Uh, and he kept it within a minute and a half as well, which is impressive when you consider what time of the evening it is. Uh, Dan, on that point about nostalgia, and then uh, Marie, and then we'll have to wrap it up after that. Yeah, look, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to consider on the nostalgia thing. I, I, I'm an economist. I work with the evidence, and every shred of evidence says we're better off. We live longer. We have more incomes. Pretty much every set of data that goes back to the 80s says that. Now, if other people have other information or data that I haven't seen, that's fine. Let's talk about it. But if we want it, we can either live in a, in a fact world or we can live in a post-fact world. And I prefer to live in a fact world. That's a 28-second masterpiece. Uh, Marie, finally, to finish up. Well, I suppose the facts are that, like, as in, you know, we have uh, thousands of families who are dependent on the state um, for a temporary housing payment or are homeless at the moment. So it is a very real issue. Um, but just in terms of, I, I suppose, you know, like, again, I tend to look at, 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 at the facts and the evidence, but I'm also very conscious that sometimes the data will not tell us everything. Right, uh, and certainly, I think that is something an issue, a, a certainly an issue with regards to the quality of work at the moment. Because uh, anybody in the construction industry will tell you that the quality of work 10 years ago or 20 years ago was far better than what it is now, because most people are not directly employed in construction. But just, um, kind of, sure. There's a number of points I suppose I want to make, but just. Uh, I, I think we have made progress as a society, but we've also retreated. And the one area that I'm thinking about is education. So I started college in the early 2000s, and I was able to do that with the benefit of free education, brought in by the Labour Party in 1997. And that was a huge benefit to a whole generation of people who previously would not have been able to, 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 to go to college. And I was able to go to Dublin because I, 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 did, I, I was able to avail of those free fees. The cohort of people now who are going into college are facing very significant registration fees, which by any other name is a fee, right? It's not called a fee, but it is a fee. Also brought in by the Labour Party. <laughs> well, now, had to go there. it was there before that, Matt, <laughs> right? Much higher, right? Um, as you know, it well. be what you and the point is, right, the right the that, that, like, is that we have a funding gap of about two billion in education at the moment, <clears> and complete inaction as to how we're going to properly fund the education system. So I suppose to just sum up, we have made progress, but we're also retreating in certain areas in education and, uh, and housing. And indeed, health to a certain extent are the three areas that I'm thinking of. Okay, 10 seconds. We're spending more on education in 2018 than we've ever done before. 10, mil 10, 10 billion seconds. euros. And, and the higher ed the presidents of any of the universities would say that they are having to deal with a lot less, we, to cope with increasing numbers of students into third level we, and much less money we, compared we to 2008. We also provide 50% of the students with a grant to attend education. I think Barry Andrews has found the topic for his next seminar the next time that he's having the public school. We had it yesterday. We had it yesterday. That was the last two. Uh, folks, we're going to have to leave it there. We're already a little bit over time. I hope you think that everyone on the panel has gotten a fair crack of the whip. Sorry to those of you who I know had your hands up, but we are limited in the amount of people we can accommodate. Yashko, please show a round of appreciation, please, from Marie Sherlock, Dan O'Brien. <laughs>